you tonight, just for 10 minutes or so, about a place. And it's a place that has some resonances with where many of us have been today. Um, but I'm not going to make any explicit connections between that place and this place. I think they'll, they'll come out in the telling. Okay, place. We begin here, Orford Ness. Some of you might know it. Some of you might have been there. A shingle spit on the Suffolk coast. The spit on the other side of this body of water here was a site for classified military research for most of the 20th century. Uh, mostly, what the work that was done there was experimental development of technologies for aerial warfare, bomb aerodynamics and ballistics. The iconic pagodas, which you might recognize if you haven't been there, you can see sort of hazily in the distance here, they were part of the AWRE site, which was the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment site, active from 1953 to 1971. These labs were used for the testing the vulnerability of nuclear weapons to vibration, temperature extremes, and shocks. Their shingle banks and roofs were designed to absorb the forces of explosion if one happened inside them. This site was acquired in 1993 by the National Trust. It's now managed as a national nature reserve. It's a rare vegetated shingle environment, and it's also a wetland habitat. On approach, curiously, to the site, this is about, this is actually on the, on the spit going over an internal channel here. The buildings seem to recede into the distance. This site distorts your sense of scale and distance. It's one of the, um, the curious features of this place. The shingle ridges are scattered with rusty debris, remnant structures. W.G. Sebald visited just before the National Trust acquired this site, and he wrote, I imagined myself amidst the remains of our own civilization after its extinction in some future catastrophe. Very early on for the AWORE site, um, that, that area that we're looking at now, the National Trust adopted a policy that they called continued ruination. The buildings in other areas of the site from the earlier era were removed or restored, but the AWRE structures were mostly left to their own devices. <coughs> There's restricted access to this part of the site, and visitors are only allowed on guided tours. There are dangers of unexploded ordnance and suspicious objects. Um, not the teasel, I think. Um, but there's been quite a lot of tidying for visitor safety. Uh, one of the things that they tell you when you get off the boat, you have to take the boat over to Orford Ness, is a visit to Orford Ness should be safe, but not necessarily comfortable. So I've spent a little bit of time at Orford Ness this year, and one of the things I've been looking at is the process that's, that these buildings are undergoing. This is the interior of one of the labs in the AWRE site. It's called Lab 1. And this pit that you can see on the right is where bombs were lowered and then uh, vibration test units were attached to them and they were sealed in and then shaken to see how robust they were. Um, it's terrifying work. Um, so this, I think this photo was taken in about 1993, just after the National Trust acquired the site and after they'd actually done their initial cleanup. They found two live bombs in that pit when they did their cleanup. Um, this is the same chamber. Um, and again, I'm not exactly sure of the date, but I believe this photo was about 10 to 12 years later in 2005. It was taken by a visiting art photographer named Chris Matthews. As you can see, the chamber has acquired a layer of moss. The wiring is sagging. Um, in the guidebook text that you carry around when you're visiting Orford Ness, there are sort of key phrases that they use. They talk about timeless natural process contrasting with transitory man-made dereliction, allowing for the natural decay of these buildings. And they're very clear that when they made the decision to let these buildings um, continue to ruin, they were being attentive to their symbolic value and their aesthetic value. But it, the archaeological value of those buildings at that point was not primary. Um, so they had different priorities. But these, this is very much the process of these buildings becoming archaeological. This is July this year. A pond now fills the pit. It's almost unrecognizable, but you can see that, that that water on the right side is actually that pit that it was in the previous pictures. I don't know what happened to stop it up, but it, it fills with water now. Weeds are growing in a sort of linear lagoon here. The building is now open to the elements. The roof has fallen in. This building and other of the, of, of the aware uh, AWRE structures are suffering from what they call concrete cancer because they use salt water in the concrete mix. 
Um, this entropic process has a really striking effect over time in, in this site. And it's something that becomes visible when you start to look at series of photos like that one. These buildings from the outside are also quite striking. This is the building we've just been inside on a windy day. Um, I spent about an hour sitting in this little entranceway here. And there were incredible sounds, the sort of flapping chunks of roof panels clunking and clanging. There was sort of irregular, eerie rhythm there. And it actually seemed somehow intentional, as if there was some sort of demon in there clashing things. It was very strange, very strange experience being inside there. So this policy of continued ruination that the National Trust um, articulated early on was one that they had to defend. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a given. Um, so they had to make a case with English heritage that this site could be the exception to the duty to protect. Nothing was listed on this site. Um, and they were allowed to carry, for, carry forth that, that policy um, in a selected area here. And this is actually quite a rare acceptance of deliberate non-intervention in, in heritage practice. Management options at places like this usually oscillate between removal and complete eradication on the one hand, which many people proposed for this site, and then restoration and elevation to the status of a heritage object on the other. But these buildings have now had 30 years of slow decline and colonization by plants, animals, and also just the, the sort of the the vigorous sea, which is right on the other side of the shingle banks here. Um, but I want to turn next to a paradox that's emerging and that has probably always been there at this site, but is becoming much more evident um, in the past year or two. So the National Trust policy of continued ru ruination was never formalized beyond the minutes of meetings um, and sort of you know, tacit agreements between them and, and English heritage. And they don't actually call that much attention to it on the site. So there's no interpretation of this decay process as such. Um, but what's been happening uh, in recent years is that there's been enough work on the history of Cold War and military sites to really revalue and reappraise sites like this one. Um, so there's, there's increasing public and professional interest and recognition of the significance of this site. I mean, it was secret, I suppose, so there wasn't, it wasn't overt in any way, but now that it's becoming, um, becoming visible, there's an awareness of the value of this site. Um, and English Heritage has started conversations with the National Trust about listing these structures, and even having them given status as scheduled ancient monuments, potential World Heritage site listing is being tossed around. Um, but this would come with some implications because the built-in mindset would be that recognition of value triggers some responsibility to protect, to do something. Attention generates the expectation of action and then the site managers are put in a position of needing to articulate again why non-intervention is a legitimate strategy in this place. They're facing increasing pressure to take incremental action to stabilize the structures and I think it exposes this embedded paradox that was there all along. If you look at their guidebook, they say, we aim in our management to preserve evidence of past use at the site and at the same time allow natural processes to run their course. Is it possible to pursue, pre pursue preservation and process as simultaneous aims? Can you preserve a ruin? And what would that mean? The contrast between the AWRE structures and the other buildings on the site is, pretty ex is, is quite extreme. They're very tidy, watertight, um, and these are just a stone's throw away from the other structures. They've had a very different treatment. Um, no decision has yet been made about the fate of the AWRE structures, and the manager, the site manager in conversation will tell you, yes, it's technically possible that I could arrest and stabilize the concrete decay, but is it justified? And that's the question he's asking himself. These buildings are still retrievable, but only just. All right, They're not yet at that point of no return. Um, but they're getting there. Unlike other structures on the site, which, which appear to be more stable, like the, the lighthouse. This lighthouse was built in 1892. It seems stable enough, but has storm clouds gathering. Excuse the uh, metaphor here, but it's only a few meters from the, the edge of the shingle bank here. Um, and they're facing having to de demolish and, um, well, decommission and demolish the site within the next few years. I want to talk a little bit about one of the 
the sort of sets of activities that's filling in this moment, this interval of uncertainty at this site. Um, Orford Ness has been attracting artists to do work there since the 1990s, and there was some significant sound work by Louise K. Wilson in 2005. But I'm going to focus on some events that just happened in the past few months. It, there was a series of commissions called Untrue Island in July. Uh, one of them was a commission of Robert McFarland to write a libretto about Orford Ness, which was set to music by jazz musician Arne Samoji, and they performed it in this building, the Armory. But the one that I actually experienced was a piece by sisters Jane and Louise Wilson, an installation called Blind Landing, which they um, created in several of the AWRE structures. It's a series of works inspired by a yardstick measure, this black and white feature you see here, which is used to determine scale in film sets. They, hand, well, they, they crafted these yardsticks bespoke in cast aluminum and then hand, oh, aluminium, sorry, hand painted them. Um, so I accompanied them on a walk and talk for local artists in July. Um, and it was interesting listening to the way they talked about the piece. So they talked about how they were working with the ruin. They talked about how Orford Ness distorts your sense of scale and the measures highlight that. They were interested in how the fragility of the measures responded to the apparent fragility of the buildings, both near collapse. One of the other installations was in one of the pagoda structures, and these yardsticks are sort of suspended in this ruined space. The measures play out against the measures which were marked on the walls of this chamber, um, because the chambers were divided up as they ran different tests. But there's this sort of oddly ecclesiastical effect with these sort of row of crosses here. It's sort of the nuclear chapel. Uh, and its floor, you can almost see this, it's, there's a shingle has come in over the top of the Clare story there and filled up the floor of this building. It's a, it's a remarkable space. The final measure that they created, um, as you look through it, it frames the lighthouse in the distance and one of the other nearby pagodas. And there were only four installations, so this is the, this is the fourth. Um, what I was interested in, in relation to the ideas that I set up at the beginning of the talk around continued ruination and intervention is the way that this art actually makes an asset of absence and fragmentation in this site. And in a way, it can be seen of a, as a validation of neglect as a viable management strategy, a form of structured, sanctioned inaction, um, and quite strategically placed um, on the part of the management to, to deflect, perhaps, some of the pressure to approach this site in a more conventional way. Um, and I think it's interesting how work like this can help us accept that structures and artifacts have a finite lifespan, just as people do. Um, so rather than trying to pull places like Orford Ness back from the brink, taking steps to ensure that their, their gradual death is attentive, respectful, and intentional, most of all, um, can be accomplished through this kind of attentive um, artwork. And so within this framework, acts of ephemeral interpretation become critically and creatively significant. And I'll close with one afterword, really, and a qualification of what I've just said a bit. Because I, think, I do think, while there is a role for art practice in this kind of space, I think we need to think harder about what art is actually doing in these spaces. Because at Orford Ness, against the backdrop of spectacular decay, there was an odd effect that happened where the art was somehow too intentional and abstract to actually be interesting in those spaces. And I think it was the problem of setting this autonomous art object into that space and having it sort of fade into insignificance against that extraordinary backdrop. Um, the backdrop of the ruined building insisted on becoming foreground. And it was an opinion that actually seemed to be shared in various ways by a lot of the other people who I talked to at the site, especially people who knew the site well and knew the structures. Um, and as I left the site um, in July, I think what I was struck by is that finding this cinnabar moth who died on the floor of Lab 1 actually touched me much more deeply than any of my encounters with the artworks that, um, that I found there. Thank you.